Um, all right, so welcome to the last of our talks before ooh, before we have a demo <laughs> and then the lightning talks. Let's not run into the projector screen there. Uh, so to finish up, we thought we'd end uh, with a talk from Josh about porting games to Linux uh, and the game which I assume he's using as his example is Day of the Tentacle. It's the true. Picture, uh, from Double Fine, which was recently remastered and... Uh, I actually bought it because I'd never legally owned a copy before and I felt bad for pirating it. Uh, so yeah, I will I just hand over to I think that's a primary market, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. <laughs> All right, so before I start, I just want to do a quick show of hands. Who here makes games? Okay, awesome. How many of you make games that support Linux? Okay, and how many of you make those games on Linux? Okay, awesome. You guys are great. And, <laughs> and, and before I start, like for you guys, this is heaps easier going back the other way. So if you want to do Linux, uh, Windows support, it's, it's like way easier than this. Um, so I'm going to have to rip through these kind of fast. I've tweeted a link to my slides, which you can check out if you want. Um, there are a couple of links and references in the slides it, that, uh, that might be uh, worth checking out if you're interested in the subject matter. Um, but yeah, my name is Cheese. I'm a game developer. I'm a Linux user. And sometimes I'm a Linux game porter. Uh, I've worked on some games that you might have heard of, and I've worked on a bunch that you probably never heard of. Uh, and I also spend some of my time helping other developers feel comfortable supporting Linux and resolving Linux-specific bugs. Uh, my current project is a first-person text adventure hybrid engine and a fantasy game that runs in it. Um, but I'm not here to talk about any of that. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about is bringing games to Linux. And the first thing you want to ask is, why do you want to bring games to Linux? Um, the most obvious thing is access to expanded markets. And you've got to recognize immediately that the Linux game market is kind of small. Um, but being in more markets means more opportunities. And although Humble don't require that for all of their bundles anymore, their highest grossing bundle, bundle, the Humble Indie Bundle, still requires Linux support. So if, you're in, you know, if you've got Linux support, then it's an option for you. Uh, I did some research on Humble Bundles, which there are links to there, uh, which demonstrated that um, Linux users were consistently paying more than any other platform. Whether they have something to prove or not is arguable, but either way, if you've got people who are happy to pay full price for your game, that makes you feel better about supporting them, perhaps. Uh, Linux users are usually pretty vocal. Word of mouth spreads really easily among the Linux community, um, and they can help you know, signal boost your game. Linux users are usually quite passionate as well. Um, they'll go up. Many Linux users will go out of their way to help others, other users. Uh, they'll help developers identify and solve bugs. Sometimes they'll reverse engineer things or mod things, and they, they kind of end up becoming these sort of passionate core community members who, who help drive an active community. Um, for any, you know, I'm sure that any of you who've tried to convince other people to use Linux, you've heard the, the, the excuse, oh, I can't, can't switch to Linux for my operating system. I need to play games. Um, and the more games that support that, the, the fewer hurdles there are for anybody who does want to do that. So you know, you're, you're adding value to any of your customers who may want to change in the future. And it's really only relevant to anybody who's doing their porting in-house, but um, the more compilers and environments and stuff you run your game in or can build your game in, like the more chance you have to find problems and bugs and things along the way. Um, and then, so the, the process of bringing things to other, other platforms is called porting. It's about... Um, making sure that all of the things you need to make the game run will work, making sure that you get rid of anything that's, that's like incompatible and, and rewrite that code. But then sometimes it's also about um, you know, embracing the platform-specific best practices or whatever the culture expects uh, you to do on that platform. Um, if, you're, if you're doing this kind of thing, free software libraries end up being really, really helpful because typically they're going to be cross-platform. Um, access to source code makes debugging things easier. Like the really big example of that is when Valve ported Left 4 Dead to Linux, uh, they were able to debug. You know, they, they had NVIDIA coming in, and they were able to debug their engine inside the closed source driver. Uh, and that source access allowed them to optimize and improve the, the game to a point where it was running faster than the Windows build. And then they were able to backport those changes back to, to other platforms. So it was like you know, porting to Linux was good for that project for every platform, which is really cool. Um, and then there are, there are as um, Paul said, you know, like people who make work on free software projects, they're super helpful. I mean, I've, I've had, you know, I've, I've sent emails saying, hey, what kind of stuff do you want included in a bug report? And then got an email back with like code that I can just slot into my project. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, and then you can also, I did an interview with um, a developer of a game called Maya uh, a couple of years ago, and he talked about how even though he didn't make use of open source uh, renderers, when he was writing his own renderer, being able to look at the source code for other um, open source renderers ended up being like a valuable reference so he could compare implementations. And I, I certainly wouldn't recommend, and I don't believe he did, you know, like just taking code and ignoring licenses. But, um, but being able to look and learn and compare implementations is certainly a great way to, um, to get perspective on the work that you're doing. Uh, there's heaps and heaps of, of, of tools around. These are just a couple that I thought of off the top of the head. Uh, while doing Day of the Tentacle Remastered, we made use of SDL, um, the GCC. Uh, I also used LLVM, Clang, uh, and I made use of the Steam Runtime as well. Um, which is just like a collection of Ubuntu libraries that uh, the Valve distribute with Steam so that everybody's got like the same versions of stuff. Um, so how can, the, how can the Linux ecosystem benefit from games supporting Linux? Uh, you know, what kind of, kind of feedback can that put back into the community? Well, sometimes it can lead to uh, new projects happening down the track. You know, as, as was mentioned earlier in the day, it's sometimes developers, when games get old, they'll, they'll release the source for them and they'll open source the engines and do that sort of stuff. So sometimes we end up with libraries. Um, I think the, the link there is for Theora Play, which is a video playback library that was made by Ryan Gordon while he was porting Shank, because uh, that's like a video heavy game. Um, and sometimes you get engines, like the ID Tech engines, the impact that they've had on not just free software games, but on the game industry as a whole, like having access to those source code and that technology and those approaches to doing things has, has just been phenomenal. And then sometimes you get whole games as well, like, like including the content, like um, Aquaria is probably the, the first example that springs to my mind uh, for that. You get upstream bug reports and patch commits, and, and any time a free software project is used in like a, a solid commercial game that people recognize as being a quality product, then that raises the profile of those free software projects. It says that they're production ready. It says that they are professional tools, and that's really cool. Um, and then all of that, you know, all those patch commits and bug reports and things can end up meaning that those of us who make free software games, which I do as well, uh, means that we've got better tools. You know, we've got more mature things to work with, and uh, we can do a lot more. So what do we end up doing if we want to port a game? Um, it's pretty easy. <laughs> There's three steps. Three steps, that's all you've got to do, and then you can go home. Um, <laughs> so you get it to compile first, um, and then you, you fix up any of the rough edges that you see, and then you package it, and then you ship it, and you go on holiday. Uh, which is, you know, it's great, right? Um, so we can break that down a little bit more. Uh, so if you want to get it compiling, the first thing you've got to do is set up a build environment that's capable of um, that either has or can build for you the dependencies that you need. Um, you can also have to end up dealing with, with any like overtly incompatible dependencies that you have. Like if you don't have source for them and they don't have Linux support, then you're going to have to replace them with something else, whether that's code you write or existing libraries. Fingers crossed it's existing libraries because it's a pain in the backside to rewrite middleware when you just want to get something shipped. Um, and then also you want to stub out any problematic code as you go. Um, so stubbing is a process of like commenting out a function's content so that the function is still called and the, the application's um, flow is the same, but it doesn't execute any of the stuff inside and doesn't throw errors and you can deal with it later. So once it compiles, um, which is sort of your benchmark, and until it compiles you don't know what's going on, you don't know if you're making things worse. Uh, so once it builds, then you know whether or not you're, uh, you're introducing new bugs. You can sit down, you can start to look at rewriting some of that, uh, that stubbed code, whether that's rewriting um, the stuff that's there or whether it's writing platform-specific implementations. You know, it depends upon what needs to be done. Uh, you'll address platform-specific bugs, uh, and then you'll do things like make sure that users save files and configuration files and stuff end up respecting, say, the STG, XDG base path spec, um, or making sure that locale support is, is good enough to pick up what the system is running and automatically use the right language. And then at the end, you want to package it up. You want to bundle your dependencies. Um, if you're going to do set up programs or package manager packages or, or whatever, you can do that. Um, writing a launch script can often be really helpful because you can have that script automatically run a 32-bit or a 64-bit binary and set the LD preload um, library path 
uh, environment variable for, for the dependencies that you're bundling. And then like everything that I've ever shipped, um, yeah, everything I've ever shipped on Linux, I've, I've just tarted up and distributed it because it's a hell of a lot easier than dealing with package managers. Uh, and I kind of feel that if, if distros want to ship some of my stuff, they can put it in packages for me. Um, now my workflow for, for Day of the Tentacle um, was to set up my build environment ahead of time. Uh, it meant that I really started work on it before I was being paid for it, so I wouldn't recommend that. But uh, it let me hit the ground running, and that was important for, uh, for the project. Uh, we had a, a tight time frame that we wanted to meet, um, and because the game had already shipped. Uh, so I felt a lot of pressure there. But yeah, we, um, I used the Mac build system as a base because uh, it was already uh, bringing in like the OpenGL renderer that was, was present in the project, and there were a bunch of existing POSIX implementations for a few bits and pieces. Uh, so I was able to like you know make use of that, and anything that I couldn't deal with in under a minute, I just I just went stub that out. I'll deal with it later. Um, and then once I got it compiling, I used grep to go through the code base and find every single if def and check and see if there was something that was being done for some specific platform, and if there was, do I need to do something for Linux? And I did the same thing for all of the build system files because it was using CMake, which means there are make uh, CMake files everywhere. Um, and, and both of those things combined with the, the sort of uh, running through and um, uh, stubbing out code, like I tried to use that as a, a learning opportunity because like the number one thing you need to do is learn the code base. You need to know what everything does. Or maybe not everything. You need to know what a lot of it does. Um, otherwise, you don't know how to, to implement what it's meant to do. Uh, so, so being being able to get familiar with the code base, being able to get familiar with the like the, the structural design decisions behind the project, and being able to get familiar with the the programmer's uh, you know coding style was super valuable. So people have said like, how oh, could you automate some of this stuff? Um, but I don't see any value in that if you've got to spend that time looking through the code base anyway. Um, and then yeah, I sort of rewrote all the remaining stub code and fixed a couple of crashes, and then we put it in a box and shipped it. So I did, I don't know how visible this is going to be. Oh, yeah, that's kind of readable, all right. Um, so I did a bit of a flow chart, um, which I hadn't done before uh, for this. So it was a bit of an exciting, exciting thing. But yeah, like just to talk through this quickly, I started off by setting up my build environment uh, and then ripped through this idea of like this loop of, of does it compile? And if it's a build problem, a build environment problem, you know, we'll tweak the build scripts or, or bring in whatever dependencies we need. Uh, if it's a dependency problem or, or some kind of problem that can't be fixed very quickly, stub it out. If it's going to break other platforms, then we do a Linux specific if def. If it's not going to break other platforms, if I can be 1 billion percent certain it's not going to break other platforms, then I'll rewrite the code. Uh, and then once it runs, uh, we just pretty much same thing again. Check it in a debugger to work out why it's not running. Um, if it's a dependency problem, and we can, or if it's not a dependency problem, we you know we rewrite or or do our own if defs. Uh, if we can easily work around it, we do so. If it is a dependency problem, if it's a dependency problem, and I can easily just rewrite the functionality, then I'll do that. If I can't and I can replace it with a free software library, then I will. If I can't do that, then I'm at the mercy of upstream support, because sometimes you don't end up with source. Um, and then you may have to end up rewriting it anyway. Whoops. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like that's, that's pretty much, that was my process uh, for doing this. And I can go back here. There we go. Um, and then yeah, just thinking about like, if you're, if you're considering doing porting, what kind of hurdles might you face as you go? Uh, as I mentioned before, like learning is the big thing. Um, you also need to, to be aware of and be considering what platform specific APIs the project is already using. So even if you don't want to know or care about Windows APIs, if that's what the you know if that's what the project is using, you need to know what that functionality does so that you can replicate its behavior. Um, licensing can be a fun thing, and not just for for open source stuff, which is probably obvious to most of us, but also for closed source stuff. Sometimes middleware that you might want to use has platform specific licensing. Um, or maybe maybe you platform, platforms are paid for separately and you have to work out who has to be pay for that and that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm not going to name any, but I, I imagine that anybody who knows of any ports that were talked about but never happened, uh, chances are that's the culprit. Um, and then you know, aside from incompatible dependencies, sometimes you'll end up with, uh, I think I've, I've used idiosyncrasies as code for bugs there. 
um, <laughs> I had a bug with um, with with fmod where it can't can't I don't know exactly what it's doing. It might be parsing the ulsa config file itself, which is mental. Um, but certain configuration file syntaxes it can't handle and will crash a game unless I can specify the index of the enumerated audio device that it needs to be using. Uh, and so we didn't discover that until it was out in the wild. Uh, and later on, I shipped a patch where uh, users affected by that could, could provide a command line option to, uh, to specify that. But that was, that was crazy, really hard to find out, really hard to narrow down once we had found it. Um, and thankfully, we were kind of able to, like those users who were like dead keen to play the game, we were able to give them alternative config file syntax that they could do, um, but that's like really awful to ask somebody to do. Case sensitivity, um, people who've thought about porting may realize that this is, is a potential issue, and I thought it was not gonna be a big thing, but it turns out it is. Um, and it wasn't in the remastered edition code, because this is a fantastic project um, from a whole bunch of angles, because uh, right at the core, right, right at the bottom, is all of this original scum code from the 80s, written by Ron Gilbert and um, Eric Wilmunder and, and other people who were doing that stuff at the time. Um, and don't really like to criticize those people, but geez, I, I really do wish that they'd use the same case for their include statements as they did for their file names. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, so I really would have liked to have been able to rename the files because that would have been the easiest solution, but if Windows users, you know, let, let's pretend that the, the version control system is able to hand case cha handle case changes of file names, people on Windows systems have the wrong case. When they pull down the changed version, the operating system doesn't know the difference. When they push it up, they're pushing it up with the wrong case. You've got two files in the repo, what do you do? So um, it, it can end up getting awkward. And you know, all things considered, I, I was glad that I had the opportunity to like just dig around, spend a bunch of time in that, that old scum code um, and find files where like Ron Gilbert is reaching out and pointing at me from the 80s saying there's a special case in hell, special place in hell for you if you edit this file. Um, <laughs> so you know, it was, it was good learning experience, but um, I certainly wish I'd been a little bit more prepared to deal with that because I wasn't, you know, it, it, was, it was pretty stressful to find it and, and see the scope of, or the scale of, of the problem and, and work out that all of the nice solutions were not available. Um, I had some fun compiler times. Um, turns out that MSVC and all the other compilers that all the other platforms used handle one out of spec statement in a particular way. And the version of GCC that I had to build this with to ship it handled it in a different way. Uh, and there was basically, there was a pointer that we're changing the value of. Um, to the return value of a function that also manipulates that pointer. Uh, and it became like a, a sequencing problem where things were done in the wrong order. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of fun to find that out. And I would recommend that anybody who has to port something, there's a lot of value in knowing your language, like knowing your spec, um, because until you encounter this, and until you get to the other end of that long and arduous process of identifying it, you will never know that it's going to happen. And the only way you can guard yourself against that is to know the spec inside out and out. Um, and then, like, ultimately, I, I feel like your goal as a porter, if you, if you want to be a porter, is to make sure that, um, or if you're being a contracting <laughs> porter, is to make sure that, um, that because usually you're on a contract, and once you, you have your game finished and it's shipped, you roll off the project, and it's somebody else's problem. You want to make sure that, your code can be merged with an upstream code base and that it's in such shape that your, the people you're working with can compile it for you or you know, can, can compile it for themselves, sorry. They can, they can maintain it if it needs maintaining. Uh, and if you don't put special care towards not breaking other platforms, then that's not gonna happen uh, and it's gonna be bad. I mean, I mean, it might be good for you in the short term and that you might get some more business, which is great, um, but it's not great in terms of you'll get a bad reputation and you'll end up shitting off users and you'll end up making your employers feel a bit also shitted off, so avoid that. And then right down the bottom, I've put distro compatibility, um, like with incompatible library versions and stuff, because I really don't think it's a big, as big a problem as a lot of people make out. Um, and then sort of to finish up some advice for anybody who's prospective 
uh, considering becoming a porter, um, is to sort of look after your body because your mind can only work as well as your body can, uh, can support it. Um, and if you don't look after yourself, uh, you're, you're going to do poor work. Um, it's really, really important, I think, and there are certainly other porters who disagree with me, but I think it's really important to consider how much, you know, what's, what's the most efficient use of your time and also of the, the people that you're working with's time. So um, I had Oliver Franske, who was the lead programmer on Day of the Tentacle Remastered. Uh, he's, he's a friend of mine, which is quite helpful. Uh, and I was able to ask him a couple of questions as I went along the way. And if I can have a half hour chat with him and save myself two weeks of digging around and scratching my head, then it's a no brainer. Like that's, that's totally the best outcome for everybody. Means that they don't have to pay for more hours, means that I get things done faster, means that users at the other end get a game much quicker. Um, you have to be able to embrace other people's coding styles and that's that's like unless you're prepared to do that <laughs> and lots of people aren't um it's really hard and you, you sit there and you can go oh what were these people thinking they should never be allowed near a computer again but if that's the way that you end up feeling like you, you can't get any work done like that you've just got to learn to embrace it and you've got to accept that all of these decisions are made before you came on and that's just the nature of of porting when you're working with other people's finished code bases um, as I said earlier, it's important to respect whatever the people on the platform expect or whatever the platform itself expects. Because um, if you just like dump everybody's save files directly in their home folder, then that's not so good. Um, working on and like, I guess this is relevant for for free software projects. If someone's done a source drop and it doesn't support Linux and you want to like work on this stuff and try and get it working on the platform, um, but if you're working on proprietary software. It's really, really, really easy to get isolated because you have a lot of stresses and you have a lot of pressures, but you might be under an NDA. And if you're not under an NDA, you probably shouldn't be talking about it anyway. Um, and you, you don't have the same kind of coping mechanisms that you would normally have in, with regards to talking to other people to relieve day-to-day -day stress. So it's, it can be incredibly isolating. You can, you can I, th I think it's really important to make sure that you have time scheduled away from the project and that you have like social time scheduled so that you're interacting with other humans. Um, and I, I wrote a lengthy article on this, uh, this topic uh, for people who like to read. Uh, but for anybody who doesn't like to read, I also talked to uh, a whole stack of other porters, including Ryan Gordon, uh, also known as Iculus, who was one of the original Loki guys, did heap supporting from, from like 1990, six onwards, I think. He's, he's so prolific. Uh, he's probably the most prolific Linux porter that there has been. Um, I also approached a friend of mine, Ethan Lee, or Flippita Jibaibo, if anybody's familiar with him. He's done a lot of um, XNA and mono game ports. Um, and a couple, of other, um, a couple of other Linux porters as well. But one of the people I talked to, his name is Leszek Odluski, and he he worked on Deadfall Adventures and Painkiller Helm Donation, and he had a really hard time with it. He didn't enjoy it. He found it thankless. He, he shipped games and people didn't like it so much, and he eventually found that porting wasn't for him, and now he's doing engine coding, and he loves it, and it's like totally rewarding for him. And the takeaway from that is that porting isn't for everybody, and, and that needs to be okay. You don't, you don't want to like drive yourself at a job that you don't enjoy. Uh, and don't get anything out of, because there are usually other options. Um, but yeah, so that that is my talk. Um, you can buy Day of the Tentacle Remastered if you're excited by that. You can you can go and look at some of my articles if you want, or if you want to like make your own cool browser-based slideshows, you can you can totally go and download the source. <laughs> I feel like that was really dry after everybody else's talks. Everybody else's talks were great. They're all animated and it was fantastic. Oh. <laughs> um, so we've got probably time for one or two questions. Um, if Rihanna, would you mind setting up in the interim? Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, <clears throat> I have a uh, comment thinly disguised as a question. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, my real question is, um, how have you found any benefit to using some of the more aggressive linters over code bases to find you know, w warning spots of places where things like dependency upon particular compiler interpretations of 
you know, unspecified behavior. Uh, has, have you used anything like that? Uh, not myself, no. Okay. I wish I could say yes, but no. And I, I can see the value, though. I can see that that would be, be definitely useful. I did make use of, um, uh, was it, is, it, is it Gold Bolt? I think it is. It's like a... Yeah, I, the reason I brought it is because I've used CPP check dealing with C++ code bases that I've been trying to get to run under Linux that were All designed right. for Windows. And things like uh, like weird initializations, and like they're relying upon MSVC taking just the right. bare number zero as initializing a struct is completely yep, uh, yep. empty, but that's <laughs> unstandard, non -standard. And I'm talked to the developers, like, I found 450 places where you're <laughs> relying on unspecified behavior, and yep. I usually just get crickets in response. Yeah, I, I actually pulled out an entire slide that was about how shit MSVC is. And, <laughs> and <laughs> but that, that kind of thing of like, if something's out of spec, you, you got no guarantees, and it can be terrible. No one's going to ask me what my favorite game is. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite game? Yeah, no. What I was actually going to ask is for the is more for the benefit of people here who you know do do games development but haven't sure. released something on Windows. Have what? Haven't have sorry haven't released supported right. something to Linux. Oops. Uh, what did you find? You know, you did beta testing for this. You know, what was the quality of bug reports you got? You know, what, um, what, what, how well did that? So, um, I had a team of, of volunteer testers. And they were people that I handpicked. They were people from the community. They were people from the ScumVM community. Um, and they were all experienced testers. And they were all intimately familiar with Day of the Tentacle Remastered. Oh, not, not Remastered, sorry, with the original game. Um, so that, that was an intentional decision to make sure that I got good reports. Um, and they, they found some things in the original game Oh, sorry, in the, in the Windows version, or, or, or in the game that were present in the Windows version that I was able to fix, that some of those fixes haven't been backported yet. Or, sorry, they have been backported yet, they just haven't rolled out new Windows builds. So Linux is definitely the best platform you can ever get this game on right now. I have a question. Oh. <laughs> has a question. What is your favorite game out of your lesser known games? Out of my games? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. Um, Hmm. <laughs> All right. I wanted to restrict the space. Okay, okay. So I, way back when 7-day FPS started, which is like this 7-day game jam to make a first-person game, um, I, that was my first game jam, and I partnered up with a couple other people, and we made a sci-fi first-person ice skating combat game. Uh, <laughs> Using a, uh, a sort of, um, uh, uh, we used Allegro, and we had this kind of like Doom style sprite based thing going on, um, and it was a lot of fun to do. And I really love that project, and I haven't had the time to come back and give it a little bit more love because I think it needs it. Um, but uh, that that's actually open source, and that's up on my GitHub account if anybody is excited about checking out that. Sci-fi. But yeah, I, it, it's kind of almost looks Tron like sometimes as well. It's neat. Thank you very much. Mm. Would you like to? I, I, we need to steal a microphone one of those. Oh, right. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, what do we do here? I'm going to.